super excited to have Niels Reimers here. Um, if you, a few of you who don't know Niels yet, uh, he's an NLP researcher. He's the creator of Sentence Transformers, um, really like, has done monumental work in this space. And he is representing, uh, you can find his Sentence Transformer work at espert.net. Um, and also a lot of his work is evident at, um, at Hugging Face, um, where you can actually, uh, which makes it very easy to use sentence transformers. We also have Dave here from uh, Pinecone, director of product from Pinecone, um, knows more about vector databases than pretty much uh, uh, everyone else in the world except a few other people at Pinecone uh, ourselves. Uh, I'm, I'm the host, I'm Greg Kogan. I'm, the, I'm from the marketing side of Pinecone. I'm here to start us off. I'll be looking at the uh, question panel at the chat, and I'll be sharing some links throughout the talk with you in the chat so you can follow along. With that, I will um, pass it off to Niels. Oh, quickly, the agenda for the chat. Um, like I said, Niels will talk about NLP, quick intro to why the hype for semantic search and take you step-by-step step through um, generating, uh, using NLP to generate vector embeddings from text and making some use out of them. And then Dave will talk about vector databases. What is it? And then have a very practical walkthrough of configuring and using vector database. And with that, I will give it over to Niels. Okay, great. Um, yeah, looking forward to, to this talk. I'm Niels. Um, I'm researcher in the field of uh, neuro search, semantic search. So I'm interested to put things into vector spaces and to do useful things with vector spaces. And over my research career, I worked a lot with vector spaces and try to, to make it better. Uh, but yeah, make it better in every aspect. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, so semantic search, why the hype? So if you notice, there's like a lot of buzz on semantic search vector spaces in this year, uh, also starting from last year, and more and more companies working in this and interested in this field. And I think the most intuitive is to show a real example. Let's take you, you have a Wikipedia for simplicity. We take the simple Wikipedia, which has 170,000 documents and you have a really simple query by user, what is the capital of the United States? If you take standard lexical search, BM25 from Elasticsearch, from Lucene, from OpenSearch, you get the top three hits are the following. So the top hit is capital punishment because it talks about capital, it talks a lot about United States, but it does not mention anything about Washington DC. Second hit is Ohio is one of the 50 states, so it also talks about states, it talks about United States, it talks about the capital of Ohio, but again, not relevant for any user. And the third hit is about Nevada, um, because it's also a state in the United States, it has a capital, but does not answer the question, what is the capital of the United States? So the user experience is really, really bad uh, from when you have lexical search. In semantic search, um, if you input this into an out-of-the-box model, the first hit is about Washington DC. So the user is happy. He asks, well, what is the capital of the United States? As a hit, you get Washington DC is the capital of the United States. <clears throat> Second hit is about what is a capital city? So what, what, what does it define? And third hit is about the United States capital. So it could be that the user maybe mistyped capital and capital and wanted to and was interested in the capital of the United States. So the results you get from semantic search is so much better from le than lexical search that the user experience for the search is completely different. When you go to the next slide. So you can also put this into numbers. So there's a quite data set on search track robust 04 from 2004 
And over the year, there was not really any progress. So since 2004, there's not that much progress. So the upper black line was the best system from 2004. And there were sometimes some systems a little bit better, but it took like 15 years until BERT came out, pre-trained transformer came out that you see uh, quite improvement. So these are the green dots we see in 2019 and 2020. And over the year, we get better and better models and a lot of progress have been made in the last two years, while the 10 years, 15 years before that, and not any progress have been made. Okay. So how does it work? Um, the most simple approach is a bi-encoder. So the idea is here, you work with a vector space. So you have some query in the, uh, you have some documents in the vector space. So every document, every blue dot you see there, you put them in a vector space so that they are grouped by the topic they are representing. And then when the user enters a search query, like a question, you also embed this into a vector space. And then you check in the vector space what is close. And you can use this um, using some pre trained transformer models. For example, you can use BERT or any other trans uh, pre trained transformer model. So you input your query into a transformer model, you input your document into a transformer model. This gives you contextualized word embeddings for all the words in your query or in your document. And then you do some pooling operations so that you at the end get one fixed size vector. And these vectors you can compare, for example, with cosine similarity. Dave will later talk about some different similarity measures to find these close entries in the vector space. And so, as we have seen before, when you enter a question like, what's the capital of the United States? You look in the vector space, find the closest Wikipedia page, for example, and this gives a good answer to the query you have. So the advantage is that it can overcome the lexical gap. So United States, people could write it as US, USA, or many other variations to express United States. <clears throat> Um, it can also respect the word order. So when you have lexical search, it does not respect the word order. So for example, when you search how to get a visa from Germany to Canada or how to get a visa from Canada to Germany, for lexical search, it's the identical search query. It cannot differentiate in which way you want to go. But for semantic search, um, it notice the difference between these two. Sorry for the or the noise in the background. Um, it's not limited to text. So you can also encode images in a vector space, and then you can encode text in the vector space, and you can do search by images. So when you search for two dogs in the snow, you get the picture of these two dogs. And it's also not limited to one language. So it doesn't matter, the vector space does not care about what's the language. If you have a respective model, you can encode text in a lot of different languages. So you can search for it in German, in Spanish, in Russian, in Arabic, in Turkish, and you always get the same image or the same hit or the same audio or the same video result. So these vector spaces are really flexible. You can also, it's not only limited to search, but it's also quite interesting for um, classification. So when you work on a chatbot or in the field of conversational AI, you often have um, the task of 10 classifications. So for example, you have a chatbot for a, a consumer bank and someone asks, uh, what is my current balance? And what you can do is you can embed this in a vector space and you check with training data you have, like what are similar sentences you have before uh, which have a label. So for example, similar sentences is what is my account balance and what is my balance? And then you check what are the closest point and then you can infer, okay, it's the same, um, the same intent. So it's the blue intent. So the blue intent means we want to show the user uh, the balance. <clears throat> so can we just take word? And the answer is sadly no. Um, it's not that simple. So actually, if we take BERT and just do the pooling, we get a worse performance than when we do um, average pooling of word embeddings of, for example, glove embeddings. 
So if you just take BERT model or Roberta model or whatever model you're interested in and just do pooling, you get a really, really poor performance. Then the question is like, okay, is there like some unsupervised way we can do? There are some approaches where, which you can do unsupervised training of transformer models, but the performance is better, you get some improvement, but it's not great yet. And you get the best performance if you have labeled or structured data. Yeah. So can you go? So, or you can use some pre-trained models. So um, on, on expert.net, you find a lot of different models. Um, and here you have to make a threshold. So you have the threshold between the performance. You have to, um, and you, sorry, you have to make a trade-off between the performance between the, the speed, the encoding speed, and the model size. And models which are big and slow are really good. And models which are fast and slim, they are not so good. So for your specific use case, you have to decide like, okay, do I need really good quality and take a big model? Or do I need like some small model, some efficient model, and I can live with like weaker performance but it's 10 times faster, for example, than the large models, then you can use the smaller models. And the models, pre-trained models that exist have been trained on a lot of data pairs. So they have, uh, we, we collected over 1 billion pairs. Currently we're trying to reach 2 billion pairs from a lot of different fields. So it has been question and answers from communities. Um, it has been title and question, for example, from Stack Exchange. It has been question and duplicate questions from Cura, from scientific domains, title and paper abstract, um, text and response pairs from some discussion uh, from some communities where people are discussing and responding to each other, from image captions, from a lot of different domains Reddit, Stack Exchange, Wikipedia, Google Snippets, Cura. Uh, scientific papers in all domains and so on. So, so there are a lot, a lot of training data you can use um, to train these models or which is even easier, just download the model and use them. However, there cannot be universal text representations. So let's say you, we have these two sentences, nuclear energy is safe and nuclear energy is dangerous. And as mentioned in these vector spaces, it always depends um, you, you always express it in, in the distance in the vector space. And do you want to have these two points be close in the vector space or should they be far away in the vector space? And this depends on the task. You could argue, okay, they should be close in the vector space because both are talking about nuclear energy um, and the safety of nuclear energy. Or you can argue, okay, they should be far away in the vector space because they express opposing views on the safety of nuclear energy. So what you want to have close in the vector space or what you want to have cement as semantically similar depends on your specific task. And hence fine tuning of your model is extremely important to get actually the optimal performance for your specific task. So pre-trained models get you to, to some degree, but to get like really, really good performance, you have to do some fine tuning with data on your own. Can you go? <clears throat> So how to train these bioencoders? This is quite easy to start with, but of course there are a lot of details how you can make it more complex and, and uh, improve it further. And there are like a different talks you can find from me on, on YouTube where I explain it in details over several hours, how to get the state of the art performance. But the most simple way is you have some positive pairs um, so you have some question and an answer, or you have an image and an image caption, or you have the, the title of a scientific paper and the paper abstract. And you want to have this pair close in the vector space. So what you see on the right, you want A1 and P1 be close in the vector space, while you want the, all the other P's in the same batch be far away in the vector space. So if you take an image and a caption, you want that this image and this caption is close in the vector space, while the distance between the image and the image caption of all the other images is far away in the vector space. And you compute this by using cross entropy loss. So given, given some, some A1, 
you check what is the right answer. So what is the right text for the image? Is it P1, P2, or P3? So you compute the distance in the vector space between all these pairs, and you say only the first one is the correct answer, and then you can do back propagation based on cross entropy loss. So the training, the basic training is not that complicated, and also getting data is not that complicated. Okay, can you go to the next slide? Um, how to improve the performance? There are a lot of different tricks. The most simple trick is to uh, work with a larger batch size. So just put more samples in the batch. And because the larger the batch size, the more candidates there are. So it sees one image. And then when you have a batch size of 100, there are 100 potential texts. If there are 1,000 batch size, there are 1,000 potential texts it has to choose from. And the other technique uh, you see here is to work with hard negatives where you specifically add some negative in the in the batch which looks really similar like a really good match but which is an incorrect match um, yeah i could talk a lot more on this in detail how to improve the performance but i recommend to to look at the other talks um, because it would take way too much time to to represent it here the other question is like how to make the embeddings multilingual um, so for English, it's really easy to find a lot of training data because we have all the nice resources. For example, from Stack Exchange, we have 30 million different question answers. Um, but for other languages, it's really hard. And one way to make it multilingual is to you first train an English model, which is a teacher model. And then you use parallel data from machine translation. So you have a text in English and, for example, a text in German. And you train a student model so that the English text and the German text is mapped to the same point from the teacher model. And so you can train a multilingual student model for your UK use case, for example, for image mapping without having actual image data in whatever language you want. So, so you just need English, English training data like image, uh, image text pairs in English and then you can use this technique to make your model work in a lot of different languages and all the languages where you have some parallel data for machine translation. Um, finally, uh, I want to present some upcoming work. Um, dense or these embedding vectors, uh, embedding approaches, they have issues um, when you go to a domain where they have not been trained on. So for example, um, pinecone, when it's, reads about Pinecone. Pinecone is rather a new company. It has not really an idea what does the word Pinecone mean and probably is, uh, associates Pinecone with like the Pinecone from the tree and how to adapt the model so that it actually knows what is Pinecone and Pinecone is a vector database so that it maps Pinecone close in the vector space. One way is to create labeled data, but this is of course time consuming. Another way is you just generate your data. So you start with some passages. For example, Python is a high-level programming language. You pass this through a T5 encoder decoder, which generates like a question or a query what people could ask, which would be happy to get this as an answer. Like the, the model says, okay, when someone asks what is Python, the person would be happy to get as an answer. Python is a high-level programming language. <laughs> And you can use this to train the bioencoder. And can you go to the next slide? And this gives you quite a big um, performance boost. So the, the performance increases by four to 10 points NDCG at 10. Um, this is quite a significant difference. So it's not like only scientific difference, but something you as a user will notice. And the nice thing about this technique is that it does not require any labeled data. Uh, labeled data. So you just need a big collection of unlabeled documents. So from legal domain, from medical domain, you generate your training data for this, and then you can train your model. And this model then works well on your legal domain, on your medical domain, on your technical domain, uh, or whatever domain you're interested in. So this is upcoming work from my PhD student, which we will release next uh, month with code and examples and a paper. So stay tuned to this really nice um, approach. Thank you, Niels. Um, 
Thanks also everyone who's asking questions. We already have almost 30 questions, so we'll try to leave a little bit extra time, even more time than planned in the end. Um, questions, keep them coming. Whatever we don't get to, we'll, we'll address by email. Um, so you just heard about um, the NLP portion of semantic search. How do you generate semantically similar vector embeddings for any kind of text or even image data. And next we'll hear from Dave about um, using that in an actual production application. Um, quick note here, there will be a uh, an interactive part where, where Dave will walk through a demo. Um, if you want to follow along, you should go to app.pinecone.io now to get an API key. Click the get started in the top right and you'll get your API key. And then when the interactive part comes, you'll be ready to go. Dave, take it away. Cool. Oh, well, thank you. And um, yeah, happy to move on to vector databases. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide? So I, uh, I learn more about databases every day. And uh, I think you know something that continues to be impressed upon me is the fact that databases work best when they are, or they really, they really need to be designed around the type of data that you're storing and that you're representing. And so we have databases for storing uh, values as in you know, key value, uh, documents, tables, SQL, you know, NoSQL, uh, graphs, and vectors as we've been talking about, embeddings. Well, they kind of break all of this, right? They, they break SQL. <laughs> uh, if you think about it, the embeddings, they represent complex objects and sentences and meaning as you, we all just heard about from Niels. And we don't expect any two embeddings really to be identical. Instead, we think about them in this, well, in a geometry as Niels was describing. Do uh, you wanna to go to the next slide? Yeah. And so the questions we think about are not how do we join tables or how do we do a lookup, but rather we ask questions about a pro proximity, uh, nearest neighbor, uh, the geometric relation between items or clustering. And so here are some of the metrics that we can use as we think about these points in this geometric space. Um, next slide. And this is hard. I mean, if you consider that, just take one dimension and divide it into two, right? Um, and then continue that. Say you had two dimensions or uh, three dimensions. And then what about 768 as in the case of BERT? And quickly you can see that even if you just divided every one of those dimensions into two parts, you'd already have more parts than there are atoms in the universe. And so this is a really hard problem, uh, thinking about geometry in this many dimensions. Thankfully, there are some great algorithms. Uh, it is also a fast moving space as people continue to innovate around these algorithms to provide better ways of thinking about, again, metrics and geometry and distance. And our, um, I'll give a plug for our, our founder, Ito. He gave a, a great talk uh, at CMU on the details of these algorithms and kind of the current state of the, the research uh, into this space of how you efficiently search across, yeah, 768 dimensions. So I won't go into that here. I'm gonna stay focused on databases, but I encourage you to check out his talk. I think Greg just put it into the chat. Um, and then do you wanna take us to the next slide? So what, what I'll talk about is the fact that we're building a database around it and this is needed. Right. If you're going to work with vectors um, and you're going to measure things like proximity and similarity, the algorithms are great, but they don't give you things like delete or insert efficiently. Uh, you want essentially all the standard CRUD operations that you expect from a database. And so this is what you kind of require to be built around it. So in the, the diagram, you can kind of picture the center as the the vector space and the algorithms for searching it. But then around that, you need the, the database to give you those types of yeah, operations to work with it in practice and in production. And then there's the piece on distributed infrastructure because to be able to scale this across many machines to go horizontal and to get better performance, you need to be able to scale it, right? And so that's another key piece that you're gonna look for in a database. And then finally to have it all managed, right? Um, 
So actually, you want to take to the next slide. So we get asked um, frequently about pods. You know, at Pinecone, we talk about pods. And essentially, pods in our lingo are shards in database lingo. And so the way that the vector database is, is architected is that we split the vectors into many pods. And these pods actually correspond to pods in the Kubernetes sense. And so we take the vectors, we divide them into a whole bunch of different pods. And then when you do a query, we query all the pods and then combine the results at the end. And so in this way, we, we provide horizontal scaling. The more pods you use, the greater the capacity that you have to store vectors. You can store many more vectors, you have more storage. The more pods you use, if you keep the number of vectors per pod low, um, the faster the performance will be because it's parallelized and it's the fewer number of vectors that each pod has to search through. And then to get things like high QPS or queries per second, we can replicate the whole thing, right? And so we can create a whole nother replica so that if queries are coming fast, they can be diverted to different replicas so that they can keep up and respond all, yeah, all simultaneously. And so we, this is another way that we're doing horizontal scaling. Um, okay, I think with that, uh, maybe we jump into the demo. And I think as Greg mentioned, you can follow along, um, go ahead and sign up for a free account with Pinecone and create your index and use your API key that you get with the account. So uh, Greg, could I share my screen? Yep, and I also put this link if you wanna follow along, um, I'll put the link in the chat. All right, um, you can see my screen? Yeah, cool. So um, here I am in a, a CoLab notebook and we'll go through this Quora search uh, demo. The first thing I like to do is just check where I'm running because I am in CoLab. Um, I'm using their free offering so I don't necessarily get control of where I'm running, but in this case, it's GCP in um, yeah, Los Angeles. Oh no, that's time zone in GCP Nevada. So the, I'm gonna install the dependencies. And of course, we're gonna start with sentence transformers. Thanks to, to Niels. Uh, we'll go ahead and get the Python client. I mean, sorry, the Pinecone client. Um, and we're gonna get the Quora data from uh, data sets. And so I already ran this, so we don't need to, to run it again. Um, so again, importing the data sets and then what I, ahead of time, uh, and James helped me out with this, uh, went ahead and grabbed all 400,000 in the full data set and put them into a dictionary and call it ID to text. And so that's gonna be a convenient way for us to look up the sentences. And let's look at some examples. So if I look at the fifth row in the data set, it gives us a pair of sentences, um, IDs 11 and 12. And it says that they are duplicate. So this is the, the label that was attached. And yeah, uh, e even though the, the words are different um, and the syntax is a little different, semantically, these are, are the same sentence. And then here's an example where they're different. And so here's a, another row where, yeah, a lot of the words are the same and yet the meaning of the sentence is quite different. And so it's labeled as such. And now let's just confirm that I, I have all these sentences in the dictionary. And in fact, for this demo, I'm not gonna consider you know, what two sentences um, were trained together as true or false. I'm just gonna take them all as sentences in the core data set. Dave, um, yep. first we can give people a, a minute to, to catch up if they are, sure. get their own notebook running. And can you explain the difference between what we're seeing on the screen and what people might be seeing if they're running the light notebook? Oh, sure. And that's a great point, Greg. Um, in this, uh, I used all 400,000. <laughs> and so, and I prepared already an index with all of this data upserted. Um, in the notebook that you have and that we shared, we made it a bit lighter. And so it's not, it's only using a couple hundred of the sentences. And that way you can create the index and upsert it pretty, pretty rapidly um, versus what I did here, which was to prepare ahead of time with the 400,000. So 
moving on, um, we're going to get a, a model. And so this model, I got it from Hugging Face. Um, it gave a nice description of what it's uh, intended for. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and import that model and then we can start using it. So let's generate some embeddings and then upsert. So I'm gonna take example text here. Um, so we'll say the text is, uh, you know, the sentence here, what's one thing you do despite knowing better from the example earlier. Uh, I'm gonna create the embedding and let's take a look at that. That's, that's what you see right here. It's 768 values. Um, and this is the embedding. So now uh, let's go ahead and put it into a vector that's gonna be used for upserting to pinecone. Um, I'm gonna change the name so we can see that it upserts something new. Let's say I give it an ID, call it VEC62. The values will be the embedding. We're gonna add some metadata. In this case, the fact that it doesn't have a duplicate in the data set. Um, and yeah, the, the length uh, of the, the original uh, sentence. And so here we can see the, the vector. So we get the name, the vector values. And at the very end, we'll see the, the metadata, right? So as a next step, let's go ahead and connect the pine cone. So I use my API key. I, I used good practice by putting it here as a file so you don't actually see it. Um, always be sure to protect your API keys. And I'm gonna to connect to Pinecone using the Pinecone Python client. You can also use Pinecone directly using our HTTPS uh, interface and JSON, but in this case, I'll use the Python. And here is how I would go ahead and create an index, uh, but I've done that ahead of time as I alluded to before, uh, and I called it search uh, webinar. So, um, what I'd like to show then is you can see in the Python console, again, this is at pinecone.io, uh, you can see that I have, you know, here's where you would create your own index if you wanted to do it that way instead of programmatically. And here it is, the, the index that I created, it's using cosine. Um, and here you can see I, I already upserted a fair number of vectors. Oh yeah, it was four, 400,000, but that was pairs. And so when I broke the pairs, uh, that's why it's 800,000 um, or not even 800,000. I'll check on the numbers later, but it was a fair number of sentences. So then let's go ahead and upsert that vector that we prepared before with the VEC 62. Okay, it upserted one vector, it means it inserted into the database and let's check our number. And you can see now it just changed to 88831. And let's go see, we can see the same in the, in the console. You can see it changed to 31. Nice way to confirm that the data is being upserted. Um, so here is a section to upsert a whole bunch of data. Uh, I won't run that here because um, it'll take some time, but I, I leave that uh, to you when you are following along to go ahead and execute that code to upsert a whole bunch of of data at once. So now let's move on to querying. And so here I'm going to take a statement, you know, which core queries are good. We'll encode it using our model and we'll query and we'll get the top five results. And here they are. Uh, and then we can go ahead and print them out. And so you can see that these statements are indeed uh, related to our to our query, you know, which Quora queries are good. Um, yeah, what are the best questions on Quora? Uh, makes a lot of sense. All right, so I'm gonna jump ahead now and show what we can do using keywords. And you'll see this in your notebook as well. So suppose, uh, suppose we wanted to go ahead and limit ourselves to something specific. Like, so we can take a question, you know, what's one thing you do despite knowing better? And let's go ahead and for every, if we wanna look for keywords, what we can do ahead of time 
is we can take every sentence in our data set and we can break it apart into its words. And that way we're, we're tokenizing, right? And we're gonna use a tokenizer uh, from transformers again. And so now you can see that we get every word that's in the sentence. Let's see if I can, uh, we'll clear the output maybe so it's not, uh, <laughs> you get the satisfaction of seeing it run. Um, so here we take all the words, right? And then we can upsert that as metadata. So do you see that here? So I'm taking the vectors that I put into the database, I'm adding these tokens as a list to the metadata. So now if I look at the vector that we upsert, I go all the way to the end, you can see that we put all these words in the metadata. And now that allows us to apply keyword filters. So now we're gonna do that same search for a search again. And this time let's limit ourselves to only answers that have the word Reddit in them. And sure enough, that's what we get. All the answers have the word Reddit. And so this is very powerful uh, when you think about the fact that you often sometimes know something in addition, right? I mean, the transformers are remarkable in how well they work and how well they capture the semantic meaning of sentences. But as Niels pointed out, you know, it is very application dependent. And one way to address that is to do the fine tuning as Niels described. I think of this as yet one other way that we can add some additional information that we may know, and that can be specific terms that we expect to absolutely be present in the results that we want. And we can therefore filter uh, from all the possible values to just those with, with the term. Um, yeah, here, some of these look a little bit repeated. And so I'm gonna take, you know, uh, we'll use another filter to get rid of the duplicates. And now we get also good results and uh, we don't see the quite as many duplicates as we did up here. Okay, let's take this one step further, right? And so I thought, uh, I'll be honest, it was hard to trick a model. Uh, the model works pretty well to get at what we mean. Uh, but here's one I figured, okay, we can trick it with this. Uh, can you teach a snake to program code in Python, right? <laughs> uh, it's kind of a you know, fun sense we can think about, you know, what is it gonna give us, all right? So interestingly, the first, the first hit has to do with snakes, right? Um, the second, uh, third and fourth are all about Python, the language. And the last one is about snakes again. And you know, this, I, I, I was quite impressed with these results. It makes sense because I mean, as a human reading this, it's not, you know, it's kind of weird to talk about teaching a snake how to code. So um, I thought these results were, were quite nice, but suppose that, given some additional information about our application, we know something like, suppose if the word snake appears, we know that we wanna talk about snakes and not the programming language and differentiate these. And so what we can do is we can also tokenize the query sentence. And so here we'll take all the, the tokens in the sentence, and then we'll ask a question. If snake is important word for us, maybe given our application, suppose we care about snakes. If the word snake appears in the, in the query, then we're gonna do a little bit of a different query. We're gonna do a query in which we limit ourselves to just those that contain the word snakes and otherwise we won't. And so now we get a different result. Now we get a result that specifically talks about, all five of them talk about snakes. So anyway, that, that walks you through um, using Pinecone and doing a semantic search. And we also showed how we can leverage the power of keywords in addition. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to, to Greg. Thanks, Dave. Um, we will get to questions in a moment. Let me just show one final slide. <clears throat> So how to get started, um, 
you can go to expert.net to get a lot of the research and resources and models that Niels has presented. Um, loads of resources there that you can see. Um, you can follow Niels on uh, Twitter, on LinkedIn. Um, for Pinecone, um, you can go to Pinecone.io Pinecone to try it out. There's actually a free tier for one pod, which should fit around a million items and give you about 100 millisecond search latency. We also have lots of resources at pinecone.io slash learn, a lot of articles about um, uh, models, question answering, um, fine tuning, uh, vector search libraries and algorithms and so on. And one last thing I will plug before going to your questions is that we are hiring. Um, so you can go to pinecone.io slash career, careers to see open roles. And I'm totally certain that Hugging Face is hiring as well. So I should plug that too. Um, if you're interested in the more, the NLP, the model side of semantic search, that's the place where you uh, should check out. With that said, um, thanks to both Niels and Dave. Um, I hope everyone here got uh, a lot out of that. We'll go to questions. We have close to 50 questions. So I'm sorry to say, we will definitely not get to all of them. I'll answer a lot of them, probably a, a lot of them by first saying that, yes, we will, this is being recorded and we will share the recording with you. You will also get the slides and all these links that we're sharing by email in the next few days. Um, so if you miss something, don't worry, you'll get it in an email soon. Now, let's just get to the questions. Um, these are more or less in chronological order. Um, um, Alexander asked, how does the gap in performance between sparse and dense search vary with query slash document length? Um, and Niels and Dave, both of you, whoever wants to take it. So I guess it's about um, the performance with sparse versus dense vectors. Yeah, and I, and and I suppose the effect of um, document length. So right. Um, maybe I, I can speak to the first part. Maybe Nielsen knows better on document length. But um, Pinecone, you know, we, we, we optimize for dense vectors. It's, it's what we expect, um, and we expect that you can get the dimensions to less than 10,000 um, using some kind of dimensionality reduction. And so it's not optimized for, for larger than that. Um, okay. As for how that, you know, sentence length, that, that's, a, that's a bigger topic. <laughs> okay, Niels, anything to add? Um, that's a tough question. So, so if you use transformers, um, you have the challenge that the runtime grow, grows quadratic with document length. So when your document is 10 times longer, you have 100 times higher inference time. So they have a natural limit of 512 word pieces, or at least a lot of models. So um, it, it, you, you cannot really encode really long documents into a single vector, but what you do is to, to break it down to multiple vectors. And there, I did not notice performance gaps between sparse and dense vectors. So both can work well. Um, also, when there's like short queries and you have a long document, so it, it works both well with different sparse techniques as well as with dense techniques. OK, great. Um, uh, Pratik asked, how do teams plan out encoder improvements in absence of click data? Uh, unsu unsupervised versus small labeled data. Niels, any thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so, so I would always just try to get data. Um, so working with unsupervised data is like really, really hard. Um, so, so currently we, we try to do this, but it's like super hard. So 
in, in practice for companies, it's always hugely better to hire people and create data or to, to mine like some data. I don't know, maybe there are like websites where you have Q&A pairs you can mine or you can use titles and documents descriptions. So try to, to get the data, mine the data or annotate the data. So this works usually better than all the unsupervised approaches. Okay. Um, by the way, to remind everyone, if you, you can ask questions, you should see a, a button to ask a question or it might be labeled as Q&A. And that, that's where I'm reading the questions from. Um, Pratik also asked a second question and several people have asked this. Um, what's the, uh, and we can try and keep this short, but what's the difference between something like a vector database like Pinecone and building something out of um, uh, a vector index like face or something else? Yeah, I, I could speak to that. I think, um, so by the way, Pinecone, um, we use various uh, algorithms uh, for different use cases for doing the vector search. In some cases we use our, typically we use our own proprietary ANN, uh, but we do use face as well uh, in some cases and we use HNSW. So we're, we're quite familiar with, with these. The difference is that face out of the box, um, some of the features that it, it lacks, I would say, or that you rather you need to add to it are the ability to efficiently insert new data on the fly. And I think there was a question about is, is the index live? And the answer is yes. The, the moment you upsert with Pinecone, the data is available, right? Uh, and you can change <laughs> the embeddings anytime you want. And so that's the kind of thing that doesn't come out of the box with like say face, right? So we provide the ability to easily update the vectors. Everything is always live. The moment you insert it, it's already there and available for search. Uh, you can also delete vectors and you can scale horizontally. So face, what you would want to do in the case of face or what we see a lot of people doing, instead of getting into the business of doing the horizontal scaling, they go vertical. And so they, they put face on larger and larger and larger machines as the demand becomes greater because the horizontal scaling is, is tricky. And so that, that's an example that Pinecone does as well as we provide the, the horizontal scaling. Okay. Um, there's a, just to mix things up, someone asked, uh, Seth asked, how would you recommend pro prototyping with semantic search to prove to non-technical decision makers how powerful and transformative this type of work can be. So kind of uh, in a business scenario, how do you maybe to a product manager or someone else who doesn't understand who wasn't on this webinar, how do you prove the value of this? I, I guess one, one example I like is um, in the e-commerce world. If you look at some e-commerce examples, go to Amazon, right? Amazon uses, you know, um, yeah, Amazon uses all this. Amazon uses vector search, right? Um, and then go to some other, you know, I don't want to name them, but, you know, just pick another popular retailer that's not Amazon and search for, you know, if it's like jeans, look for like ripped jeans or a dress I could wear to a party, right? Or something, you know, quite nuanced, right? In, in what it means and see the difference in the results. Uh, Amazon uses vector search and its results are usually quite impressive. Whereas a lot of e-commerce websites, when you search for the results, it's just keyword search. And so you, you're not gonna get those results. If you ask, what dress do I wear to a party? It's just gonna pick up on the word dress and miss all the other nuance that is in that statement. And I think those can be fun examples to show people who aren't accustomed to this space. Um, Neil, say anything to add to that? If not, I have a technical question for you. Um, yes, so I also have a demo on expert.net, which compares lexical search to semantic search on Wikipedia. And this is also a demo I like to use where you input simple questions like what's the capital of the United States? And then you see what you get from lexical search and what you get from semantic search. And it's obvious to even non-technical person, okay, this lexical search is so bad and semantic search is so much better. So, so if you're in the field of text search. Yeah, we find that with um, 
seeing is believing with things like this. Um, the tables and, and measurements of accuracy that we saw, that's for, that's for the technical audience. If you're trying to convince a decision maker, you know, they, they know what it looks like to have a bad um, search result or a good search result because they use search all the time. Okay, uh, Christopher asks, how should one go about fine tuning a sentence embedding model to include domain specific terminology? For example, niche medical concepts. Um, yeah, this is exactly the work my student Keixing Wang is working on. So it's still a big question how to include this domain specific terminology. Um, we hope that this GPL technology where you create, where you generate the, the training data can help to, to get this terminology, but it's not the final solution. So it's still a big research question how to get the terminology, how to update domain specific terminology. So I think several PhDs will be written on these before it will be solved. So it's ongoing work. Okay. Um, uh, Yusef asked, how do you choose from BERT or T5 encoder decoder on a particular task? So this sounds like, how do you choose, uh, how do you choose a model? Um, I assume it's for, for search. Um, so, so T5 does not work that well because it's an encoder decoder architecture, but usually you just need an encoder architecture. Um, but then it's more and more testing. So I did not find yet good correlation how you can say should you take BERT or Roberta or DistoBERT or XLNet or DBERT or whatever. So the, the glue score and super glue score does not correlate with the performance of the embeddings. And you just need to test it on your data and see what works. Okay, here's, a, here's an interesting one. Uh, Alberto asks, based on your experience when creating document embedding from a list of sentence embeddings, sounds like merging sentence embeddings into one embedding, what is the best way to combine them? Uh, I.e., are, are there better approaches than average pooling? I personally would not try to combine them because you lose a lot of information. I mean, if you do the average of all the sentences in Wikipedia, you get just some random point in the center, but it does not contain any more the specific information what you can answer on Wikipedia. So it's averaged out. So um, I, I always try not to, to average them, but keep them individually and design your application to work with them individually. Okay, let's choose a database question. Uh, Wade asked, why not just use Postgres? Are you there, Dave? I got caught up in the other questions. Well, why not just use Postgres? Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, so Postgres is a you know, more traditional uh, database. Um, and so I, I guess maybe I'm, I'm missing the question that are you using Postgres to look for similar vectors um, or, or the keywords? The keyword part, I, you know, I think, yes, you know, Postgres you know, can be great for that. But uh, when it comes to vectors, Postgres, to my knowledge, I don't think there's a plugin or, or way to do vector search or apply one of the vector you know, ANN um, algorithms uh, to it. I don't know if that answers the question or maybe if Niels has other thoughts. Maybe I'm a little confused by the question. Yeah, I think, um, I, I, I hope it does. Um, basically, you need to have a vector index to be able to search by similarity to do an ANN search yeah. through vectors. It's not enough to just store the vector value um, in a row. Um, let's see, uh, one more database question, um, more of a solution question. Is this available on, is a solution based on AWS or GCP? I presume this is talking, this, Yusef asked this, and I presume this is talking about Pinecone. Is it on yeah. AWS or GCP? Yeah, so the answer is we, we, um, we operate on both. Right now, uh, what we offer 
uh, for the free plan and the standard plan is limited to GCP, uh, but that will be changing soon uh, as we continue to test with AWS. And then you'd be able to choose between AWS and GCP. And, and certainly if, if you're calling Pinecone from the same cloud provider that provides some advantages in terms of speed, and then if you're in the same region that provides a lot of advantage, same region, same cloud provider, um, much lower lat latency. Okay, um, just a few minutes left. I'm gonna pluck a few from the list. Um, Paulo asked, any DPR multilingual available? Uh, I said the NQ, it looked like the NQ one was only in English. Um, yes, so, so multilingual is a big challenge. We're currently working on it um, with a lot of different researchers from different institutes interested in this multilingual field where we're currently creating resources. So the biggest bottleneck are resources. Um, so we're collecting big data set of 500 million multilingual Q&A pairs. And then we will train multilingual models on it and that work well for semantic search in a multilingual setting. But this is current active research work. So, so far, um, there are some multilingual models, but they don't perform not as strong as the English models. Great. Um, Sankar asked, is Pinecone uh, in memory or is it persistent, i.e. just to store vector data on disk? Yeah, so I can take that and um, we, we do both. And so uh, Pinecone, uh, the, the free tier, get to what we call our P1 pods, which are all in memory. Uh, but we also have the option in the paid plan for what we call our S1 pods. And the S1 pods are split between disk and memory, um, which can provide as much as a tenfold uh, savings. Uh, in, or rather, at the same price point, you can store many more vectors Great. per pod. All right, let's give the last one to, to Niels um, from Pratiba, who asked, your opinion on Bert versus, versus Roberta? Bert versus Roberta. Um, so for, for embeddings, I did not notice big difference between Bert and Roberta. They, primarily perform similar. So my favorite models currently, which performs best is MPNet from Microsoft. So it has the same size and architecture as BERT and, um, but, but uses a different pre-training architecture. And if you want to have a small efficient model, I like mini LM also from um, Microsoft. Also same architecture as BERT, but it's reduced to six layers and 384 dimensions. So these are my two favorite models which perform best on embedding tasks, MPNet and MiniLM. Great, okay. So many, uh, so many questions still unanswered. Sorry, we didn't have time. We'll, um, we, we do have the questions saved and We'll make sure Niels and Dave both get, to, both get to see them and can follow up with you. Niels, how do, if someone has a question for you after this, what's the best way to reach them, uh, for them to reach you? Uh, yeah, when it's general question on sentence transformers, the best way is to create an issue on GitHub so that all, also other people can see it. Um, when it's not directly connected to sentence transformers, reach out by email. Okay. Which, what's your preferred email? Uh, info at niels minus rhymos.de. So if you. Uh, and that's on your website, esper.net, right? They can find yeah, it. Yeah, I mean. Okay, uh, great. You can also email at niels at hugging face co. Um, they all go into the same Thunderbird inbox. And then search so just search for any email address from my site and. And Dave, and, and uh, how, do, how do people, uh, how can someone ask you a question? Yeah, feel free to uh, reach out. It's dave at pinecone.io. So it's pretty easy email address, but also 
course, there's support at pinecone.io, which we you know, respond to as well. Yeah. OK, thank you so much to everyone who joined. Thanks to Dave and Niels for the time. Um, this was incredibly informative. And I hope everyone has a great day wherever they are. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye-bye.